Hi, everybody. Um, we're very lucky today to have a panel of experts on cloud kitchens. And the topic, of course, is how cloud kitchens are reshaping the future of restaurants. Um, my name is Victor J. Chow. I am the founder and CEO of Three Square. We also have a cloud kitchen type concept and internet restaurant group. Uh, but we're here to share with this great experienced group of people about different cloud kitchens and how they perform. Um, real quickly, we have Mario Suntanu, who is the co-founder and CEO of Yummy Corp. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing cloud kitchens in Southeast Asia. Yummy Corp operates more than 70 cloud kitchen locations across Indonesia. Next, we have Jonathan Vines, who is the founder and CEO of Pop Meals, formerly Dama Khan, and is a top player in the Malaysian market. After that, I'd love to introduce Kelvin Subowo, who is also from Indonesia and is the co-founder and CEO of Daily Box. Uh, founded in 2018, Daily Box is an emerging star, also in Indonesia, as I mentioned, and they have a very unique strategy that I'd love to talk about more later on. They're growing rapidly, and now they have more than 120 locations across Indonesia. Finally, uh, my fellow countryman, Jason Chen, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Just Kitchen, and also operating, like I said, out of Taiwan, like myself. Just Kitchen is the first cloud kitchen in APAC to become publicly traded, which is uh, very impressive. And this obviously sparks a lot of questions and thoughts from people in Taiwan and internationally. And we'll definitely look into their unique business model with Jason today as well. So let's have a big round of applause for all of our speakers today. So, I mean, first and foremost, let's get right into it, right? So in cloud kitchens, there's a lot of different business models um, as we all just discussed. And even in one market, you can see a lot of different models being implemented. So can you guys share more about your company and your business model? What makes your cloud kitchen unique? And how does this model provide competitive advantages in the market you're present in? So let's start with Mario. Hey, Victor. Um, thanks for the time. And thanks, Footland, for arranging all this. Uh, it's great to speak with you know some of the names that I've read through in in articles and have never had a chance to meet. So, uh, you know, happy to trade ideas and share thoughts, and hopefully something great comes out of this. So, just a quick introduction of what Yummy Corp does. So, Yummy Corp operates a, a set of Yummy Kitchens. Today, we're a little bit over eighty kitchens, but uh, and our, we take a different approach in the sense that um, in, uh, in the sense that instead of operating, so the, the two common or the two main business models in the cloud kitchen space, uh, where the players are all uh, are all here, right? I would say are people that are operating the facilities and infrastructure uh, and technology behind the infrastructure, and then the uh, and then uh, businesses that are operating the brands, right? Where the uh, brand the value building comes in the brands, right? We have you know. Kelvin is essentially the, the the one that is leading that that uh, that strategy here in Indonesia. Yummy Corp takes a different approach where we work with existing brands. So Yummy Kitchens, uh, Yummy Corp doesn't own a brand, a single brand, right? And then the way we do is we work with people like Kelvin and other brands that uh, other brands in the market that want to scale fast um, uh, using. Uh, online delivery channels, right? And we provide the facilities, but also the, the people management and the operation management um, uh, required to scale fast, right? So the idea is that you can grow really fast without having to build your own kitchens, without having to build your own technology, without having to build to hire your own people. We become your partner in you know, uh, reaching that 80 plus, 100 plus locations as you see fit, right? Um, and in, in terms of our strategy, we don't, we, we assign the people, we train the people for a specific brands, but we actually assign them, or we train them multiple brands so that during the, the peak hours and the, and the slow hours, the, the people are working on different brands. Wow, Mario, thank you so much for sharing. That sounds excellent. Sign me up. I'm working with you when I go to Indonesia. You yes. can visit me. Yes. Um, Jonathan, how about you? Please share more about your company and business model. 
Yeah, so I think um, uh, it's super interesting to hear uh, from Mario. Um, thanks for sharing that. So, um, for us, uh, quite a different approach. So I guess like our mission is really to to bring like the most exciting food into every neighborhood. And um, so we we operate um, one main brand called Pop Meals, and then we also have a couple of kind of virtual brands. Um, but kind of the distribution model is quite different. So we actually uh, we operate um, what we call smart outlets. So smart outlets are essentially um, a, a hybrid between like a cloud kitchen that serves uh, yeah, purely for delivery, right, on, on marketplaces as well as also our own delivery, um, but also it allows customers to actually buy food for takeaway and dine-in. And um, this, this is all done through the PopMutes app. So um, we have one app where you can, as a customer, you can order for delivery, you can order for dine-in and takeaway. And this is really central for us to, to get a lot of um, feedback data that we uh, use then to to optimize the menu, right? The food offering in every um, smart outlet that we have um, should be then uh, hyper locally customized for the local preferences. And yeah, currently we have uh, 12 of these smart outlets operating and opening roughly now every every week, every one and a half weeks, uh, another smart outlet. Well, thank you for sharing, Jonathan. Um, whenever I go to um, Malaysia. Uh, I always stop by one of your outlets because it used to be close to some of where my company is or my previous companies are. And I'm always very impressed with the different tech uh, advantages and new services and new products that you add in there. So it's very interesting to me. Congrats and thank you for sharing. Um, next, Kelvin, can you please share more about your company, more about your business model? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Victor, for inviting me. Such an honor to meet all of uh, uh, my, my friend and hopefully uh, we can collaborate more in the future, in the near future, especially when this industry is very, very hot right now, right? I think we are blessed. We are tapping in this industry with a great momentum, a great trust from uh, all of the markets and well, it's uh, collaboration time. So uh, it's great to know all of you. So basically, uh, to put it simple, Daily Box as a group is an all restaurant. Uh, we are focusing on distributing our products through online channels, uh, through online delivery platform, through e-commerce. So basically, where conventional restaurants usually have to uh, have a big kitchen, strategic locations, we focus strongly on innovations of our products utilizing the growth of online food delivery e-commerce. So uh, in terms of the operations, we, we are more uh, efficient. We uh, definitely, our growth also supported by uh, Yummy Corp. Uh, like I said in, in the early of the conversation, we are blessed to know Mario and Yummy at the early days, uh, even, even before the pandemic. So uh, yeah, we, we are both working together very close to grow uh, in the sector. So uh, our brand consists of daily box. It's a rice box. Uh, we are, uh, it's a rice box brand and we have also daily meals. It's a frozen uh, pack products uh, selling through e-commerce. And we also have Shirato. Shirato is a sushi to go. So if uh, like Yami focus on uh, the facility infrastructure and the tech, we are focused on developing the brand. Uh, focus, focus on innovating new menu, new products, and uh, focusing on brands like Daily Box, Daily Meals, and Shirako, and expand uh, majorly to uh, Cloud Kitchen. Right now, we are operated, we are self operated, uh, except with uh, Yummy, uh, obviously. So, uh, we have operated now in 120 locations across 10 cities in Indonesia. So uh, the numbers uh, keep growing. Hopefully we can hit around 150 uh, by the end of this year. Oh, wow, that's amazing, Kelvin. Thank you so much for sharing. I love uh, that story of uh, working together with others since this is such a great ecosystem and it's a really hot topic right now. Um, right. Finally, last but not least, uh, Jason, can you please share more about Just Kitchen and what Just Kitchen does? Sure. Thank you, Victor, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> so we're, um, you know, I always draw the analogy to like to e-commerce, right? So there's there's infrastructure, which is the internet, and then there's the delivery partners, and then there's the brands. So what we do is we, you know, we the only the only 
vertical that we're not in is delivery. So we, you know, we uh, own and operate our own kitchens. So we don't, we're not a cast. We don't share kitchens. Um, so, so we build the infrastructure and we build the distribution network. So right now we're operating in Taiwan and in Hong Kong and looking to expand throughout Asia. Um, so these kitchens are, are um, again, self-operated and, um, and, you know, it's, it's about, it's about getting, getting distribution and getting proximity to, to our consumers. And then in terms of the brands we operate, we both operate our own developed um, virtual brands, our proprietary virtual brands. So we have 16 brands that we develop in, in-house. So we have a strong culinary team that do that. Um, at the same time, we also have 10 brands that we partner with. Um, you know, some of the partnerships are with local heroes that are, that are enterprise in Taiwan uh, that have multiple locations, but they're looking to, um, to widen the distribution network or to go abroad. Um, at the same time, we have uh, international brands, which we work with, um, that we bring in from overseas into Taiwan and into, into Hong Kong and then you know, eventually onto other regions. And these are brands that, um, that, are, that are internationally known through enterprise like TGI Fridays, um, uh, Smith & Wallensby, like Paul Bistro. Um, so we, we do kind of, um, kind of both on the brand content side, we, we, you know, we develop and we also partner um, you know, with the goal of basically being able to distribute as many brands and as, as many cuisine types to as much of the audience as possible. Awesome, Jason, thank you so much for sharing. Um, as someone in the space who's in the same market as you, it's very inspiring to see how you guys grow and just how quickly you do so. Thanks again for sharing. Um, on to our second question. Um, I think a lot of people always comment about this, but I mean, we have a very unique insight to how the pandemic has impacted our businesses. So, you know, conventional restaurants, really have seen such a massive hit in their business uh, during COVID-19. Um, on the other hand, delivery services and cloud kitchens, uh, on the most part, have seen a big boom. So as we look ahead to this new normal in the F&B business and food tech, what drivers do you see in the future growth of cloud kitchens and virtual brands? Uh, especially, let's focus on uh, Asia, APAC, Southeast Asia first. Um, Mario, can I trouble you to kick off this uh, question, please? So, <clears throat> um, thanks, Victor. So let me so let me just put a little bit of context where I think um, during the pandemic, conventional restaurant businesses saw a massive hit. In I would say that in Indonesia, it's a little bit of a mixed effect on the cloud kitchen side, right? I think it gave opportunities for a lot of cloud kitchen to shine. But on the other hand, I would argue that the whole delivery ecosystem would have grown faster without the pandemic mm. um, as opposed to with the, uh, uh, during the pandemic, right? I think a big part of it is um, it, the, the general behavior that we saw was that, you know, people uh, with the pandemic, I think um, it did, it, uh, the, the, rest, the, the dine-in restaurant did take a massive hit and that essentially was eliminated for a few months, right? But most of the most of the mi migration of that uh, activities, instead of going to uh, delivery, which was already prospering and growing fast regardless of the pandemic, most of them actually went to uh, people eating at home, mm -hmm. uh, which was traditionally the behavior that wasn't really there. Uh, uh, it was actually declining uh, overall. Essentially, got resurrected. Um, uh, through the pandemic, right? I would so post pandemic, I would actually see that delivery the delivery market in Indonesia would grow much faster. Um, where the residential behavior of people are already used to um, uh, ordering from um, the club kitchens will be still there. But the bigger use case in uh, in big cities in Indonesia is actually ordering food from at work where you don't have the facilities, you don't have the access, you want the variety, you are eating together as a group in which you usually consume a bit more, right? So, so we are, you know, uh, we're hoping to see actually uh, faster growth, even faster growth post-pandemic uh, for the cloud kitchen and delivery space. 
very interesting take on things. I'm sure a lot of people who are not in the industry think a little bit differently, but you know, I would yeah. say personally, I do agree with you also. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, how about you? What are your thoughts on this new normal and how cloud kitchens will move forward and what are those drivers? I think, uh, uh, Mario, thanks for sharing that. Super interesting. I, I, uh, yeah, I didn't know that about this, uh, about Indonesia. So, uh, yes, yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah, and, and I think in Malaysia was, uh, it's slightly, um, different. I think, uh, what we have seen, um, there are a lot of dine in moved, uh, into also takeaway. Um, and of course, delivery, uh, massively benefited in a sense from, um, from the, from the lo various lockdowns that we had in Malaysia. Um, I think in a post, pandemic world um, that we are in Malaysia already entering and I think across Southeast Asia also moving to it's it's um, what what we believe in this is really uh, it's going to be heavily omni-channel um, right and it's kind of also how we build our business um, to um, to be ready for that or benefit from that so that uh, customers are now much more used to to all sorts of different ways to order right being it not just uh, either you dine in or and delivery but but uh, takeaway um, and and also especially using um yeah mobile phones uh, much more in in kind of the 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 offline dining um context which previously wasn't the case but obviously during the pandemic everybody started to use like qr codes you had to check in when you want to go into a restaurant etc so i think that's something um where we believe this will uh, definitely stay and um i think a lot of also probably the e-wallets are, are getting now a bit more uh, more uh, adoption here in in, uh, in Malaysia, etc., which was typically quite lagging actually behind that. Um, so I think all of this coming together, really, again, what I said at the beginning, it's um, it's uh, going to be a very omni-channel experience um, where customers um, are much more flexible in terms of uh, the way they get their food um, to just find the most convenient way for themselves uh, in the specific use case they're at at that moment. Thank you for sharing, Jonathan. Um, yeah, that's a very, very interesting take. I love how you mentioned the e-wallets and how people are attached to their phones even more so. So that's a you know part of that new normal that we see. I, I totally agree with you on that too. Kelvin, what's your take on this? Uh, what do you see as this new normal post-COVID situation and how we as cloud kitchen operators uh, will be growing or moving? What directions? What do you see? I think um, Mario and Jonathan already uh, sum all of what I want to uh, uh, share with you. <laughs> but let me share the perspective from uh, brands, because basically we are collaborating with a lot of cloud kitchens, right? Uh, we're utilizing cloud kitchen as our main channel to uh, uh, sales, also uh, online food delivery platform. So. Uh, what I see is innovations is the key because right now, as you know, uh, me as my background is from conventional F&B restaurant. Food sometimes is a low entry barrier market, especially now when everybody can register their brands inside the platform. You flooded the market with a lot of new brands, a lot of a lot of new things, which is good actually because you know it. Uh, gives uh, it shows the appetite of uh, the growing industry of online uh, delivery. But uh, if if we want to make this sustainable market become a sustainable market, we have to create an innov innovative products, innovative brands. You know, not only copying other brands, selling a cheaper price. There's gonna be a price war. Suddenly, promotions everywhere, and it's just. Uh, suddenly gonna, you know, uh, killing everyone in the market. Uh, so it's very important to uh, do it differently from brand perspective, uh, especially I think Jason knows it better when the big brands also start to expand beyond opening outlets uh, like conventional way, they also adapting the, 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 uh, this delivery uh, stuff. Uh, and uh, in terms of brands we also must uh, realize that um, expanding uh, i'm talking in the perspective from indonesia actually uh, the market sometimes people only see it in uh, major cities where uh, you know food deliveries are uh, already penetrated but actually there's a lot of tier two tier three cities here in, in indonesia and i also believe in southeast asia where uh, eventually the food delivery market will penetrate 
at someday at that at that point, you know. But when 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 the competition is to saturated in, in the one cities or one region, it it it's gonna slow down. So I think what drives uh, it's gonna be a hyper growth for our industry in the next few years is where a lot of brands also ex- trying to expand, utilizing people like uh, Victor, like Jason, who uh, like Mario. Uh, who expand their cloud kitchens also into tier two, tier three cities, you know, preparing the infrastructures into the next cities where, because the market, the food market itself is very, very huge, as you know. Uh, I don't know the number in Southeast Asia, but here in Indonesia, I think that food delivery market is still less than 10% of our total food market. So we barely scratch the surface. The potential is very, very high. A lot of things to explore and uh, yeah, I think uh, this should be a collective effort, uh, as especially us in here. Everybody needs to, you know, create a collaborative effort to grow the market first, uh, beyond than just uh, cities, uh, major cities. Thank you, Kelvin. I, I really like your brand-centric point of view on this, and it gives us a little different angle when we talk about these different things. Uh, Jason. What about you? What are your thoughts here about, uh, you know, how this new normal is? Uh, you launched, uh, I think, two years ago, and pretty much immediately COVID was right then and there uh, at your door front. Um, what do you see and how do you see these drivers and how it's affected you? Um, yeah, no, I think, I think it's exciting times. I think, you know, I think as echoing everyone, everyone said, I think, there's, there's, I think everyone recognizes that there's a, a huge amount of runway ahead of us. Um, you know, I, I myself also came from somewhat of a, a FMB background, been involved in the business for about 10 years. And really from, you know, from QSRs to fast casual, there hasn't really been anything new in the FMB business for, you know, the good part of 20, 30 years. And I think for the first time we're seeing, you know, this, this, you know, because of COVID, because of, it, I think it heightened the awareness of delivery. And, um, and I think it's brought on sort of a, a, a multiplicity of different ways of, of doing delivery, ways of doing brands, ways, ways of representing existing brands, pivoting into new brands. And, and, you know, so on the brand side, I think it's super exciting for consumers. Um, a, lot of, a lot of new varieties are coming, coming um, to be available to the consumers on a, on a delivery basis. And, and at the same time, getting better at doing it. You know, people are caring more about packaging. People are caring more about how he how he travels. Um, so I think super exciting times for consumers. Um, and then, um, you know, as I think um, I think Jonathan has said earlier, um, different methods of delivery. I think is is you know with QR coding, with geolocating, even in physical restaurants, servers, you know, contactless. I think all these things are are as a result of of um of, of covid um but that's it's introducing a whole new experience for for dining in for takeaway for delivery um so i you know i i think um and then the dsps are, are develop, you know doing different different things as well you know it's not just you know it's just not just a, a you know a one you know one shot you know scooter car delivery now people are doing different verticals in delivery q commerce is emerging um, so I think, I think it's super exciting for, for the consumer, um, to be, to be sort of what's to come, you know, what's to be expected. So, yeah, no, I think, um, I think, um, ex- exciting times ahead. Thank you for sharing, Jason. I agree with you. It's really is, uh, exciting times ahead. I see, you know, you mentioned Q commerce or quick commerce. I'm probably sure that that's another chat in another, uh, in another group, but I mean, I can't. It's, it's crazy to me. I see for Q Commerce, just to hijack the conversation real quick, I see in the US, in Europe, they want to do 10 minute deliveries for groceries. Um, I come from that space as well, and that just boggles my mind uh, when we used to do, you know, at best 30 minutes. And we thought, wow, 30 minutes is killing everybody. And now, uh, you know, just two, three years later, people want to do 10 minute deliveries. So, you know, I think. I'm sure everyone here is nodding their head, but you know, the, the, at, at the end of the day, consumers are really enjoying all these new services, all these new products that, that all of us have to offer. Um, 
So yeah, let's continue though. Uh, compared to the conventional traditional restaurants, I think um, at least how I see it, uh, cloud kitchens have the potential to access more data and larger amounts of data, um, whether it be for menu creation or location selection or even more, right? I mean, just to share a little bit, my, my parents owned restaurants and back in the day, they don't have all this information. They're just like, oh, this place seems okay. Uh, the rent is not too expensive. I think people here would eat Chinese food. Let's do it. But I'm sure, uh, you know, 40 years later now in 2021, that's not exactly how all of us look at data at all. So um, how do you leverage it? Um, Mario, let's kick off with you once more. So I would say, um, Victor, that at least in this market in Indonesia and, uh, in, and developing Southeast Asia, they, um, I think right now we, we as you know, more of a technology-driven company uh, in the cloud kitchen space, we try to use as much data as we can, but we are still in this transitionary kind of time in the industry where you are moving, you know, you're getting closer to a technology company, but you're ultimately, uh, but still a lot of the FNB limitations of data about customers, um, about, you know, uh, I think you can do a lot of, you can manage a lot of internal data, but external data, uh, the, the access to external data is still very much uh, limited. So, uh, so I think that is going to be a challenge that we're going to see for the next two, three years. I think um, Kelvin would also uh, see similar challenges. And I would say it's not just Indonesia. I would say if you do, if you go to Philippines, Vietnam, all of these countries, uh, this, this lack of uh, access to data, just because uh, today it's a duopoly, or I guess Indonesia is expanding in terms of delivery platforms, but the key delivery platforms are still limiting their access to data because that becomes still a very strong part of their competitive advantage. Um, so we are, we as an infrastructure player, uh, we are actually uh, building a few initiatives to, to manually start collecting data for our brand partners uh, with the expectation that we either figure out how to automate it internally, or at one point uh, we will be able to get access to that data from the source directly. <clears throat> So, um, so yeah, so I think data is a sensitive topic, but it is a key challenge in the industry that, uh, that we are looking at uh, and figuring out how to solve pretty much at the moment. Thanks, Mario. Um, yeah, you are right. Uh, in most countries, it's either a duopoly or there are three, mark, uh, three competitors as far as delivery platforms go. And sometimes it's tough to get some of the data you need to be shared with you. And, uh, I think a lot of us do feel that way. Um, but uh, how about you, Jonathan? Um, how do you guys look at data and how do you leverage that? Yeah, I think it's a super important point for us um, because essentially um, how we first started out was uh, that we, um, all of the, the foods, uh, all of our menu and all of the dishes, etc., was developed by uh, like a very, in, a, in a very traditional way, right? Where you, where you hire some, visionary chef and then he he's this creative you know big personality and then he comes up with a some great uh, a new dish and then maybe it works maybe it doesn't work mm -hmm. and maybe if it works after you know a couple of months it just uh, consumers don't are not interested anymore so, so what we realized during that time was like the failure rate was so high um, of these new menu items and for us yeah, the big ambition is to kind of constantly uh, innovate on the menu and to launch new menu items that we uh, we uh, I quickly realized this is like um uh, this is, is going to be a big challenge if we kind of follow this traditional approach in that new context. So, um, yeah, we worked very hard on kind of getting a lot of access to data and therefore, um, uh, yeah, we, we, I mean, we have our own app, right, where we collect data from the customer for every order. So in terms of, you know, feedback when they, uh, when they order from us, um, you know, we have more than 40% of people like essentially rating and saying, okay, I like this dish. I maybe, hey, uh, can you make it more spicy or something like that? And we, this, this data is then used to, to completely change the menu development process. So now we, we and then they require quite a lot of, uh, you know, mindset shift uh, internally, which was not easy to do because uh, it's very kind of different what's, what's been done in the traditional industry, right? Um, so instead of having now, now our R&D team kind of constantly coming up with this new creative ideas, they essentially have to look at the data and it's always like, uh, we always ask them, okay, what do the customers say? What do they want? You know, what's the feedback, et cetera? 
Um, so yeah, so that's now how we operate. Um, uh, again, kind of underlining uh, how important data is for us in terms of the, the menu innovation and just serving customers better. Um, yeah. But it's, it's really these two pillars on one hand, right? Having like, uh, I mean, a very different approach in terms of the, the, the new product development. And on the other hand, um, having developed our own app for uh, where we can then uh, serve customers for with our own fleet and have their the direct access. Um, because indeed from uh, when working with like aggregated partners, uh, there's obviously always just a bit this tension in terms of, you know, what's the data that, that we can get? What's the, the data they want to share? So yeah, it's always a bit of a challenge. Thank you for sharing, Jonathan. I think uh, something very interesting that you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, you find this uh, creative visionary chef uh, and they make stuff and it works, doesn't work. You know, we make some assumptions and I think uh, we try to meld this vision of food, right, or cuisine and try to back it up with this data. So we, we, we don't guarantee success, but at least we can uh, reduce the, uh, you know, the, the, the brand's failure rate by a little bit or by some amount, right? Because it's sort of like these two yin and yangs that really can balance it out. Um, so let's uh, go down to the next uh, set of questions, right? So there's someone with a background or several people actually with background in FMB in this uh, discussion right now in the more traditional sense, right? So I think Daily Box saw an opportunity in the cloud kitchen model and pivoted quite successfully. Um, how do you think your previous experience has helped you to think differently um, when it comes to a, you know, a tech company like Daily Box? Kelvin. Sorry. Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, Victor, uh, data plays an important role, especially most of our teams right now in Daily Box is uh, the team that helped me building our conventional restaurants uh, a few years back. So uh, going into this industry, definitely we learn a lot how to analyzing the data because as Jonathan also mentioned, that it's very important for you to innovate new menu, especially with the limitations of data available out there. You know, you need to scrap some data with your own res resources, trying to gather what works, what not. But uh, I think growing in the food uh, industry for us, for our team, help us to uh, analyzing uh, in terms of operations operations excellence in terms of costs, as we know in, in, in our, our industry. COGS food costs plays a very, very important role, especially when the food delivery uh, takes some commissions from our top line, right? So, so it's a variable cost and uh, how we able to maintain. I always said uh, food business is all about how to you not cutting down your costs, but managing your costs. So you can get with the uh, uh, value for money products to to the customer. So, what help us is actually we we also uh, put our eye on target into growth because as as we all know, these tech uh, implementations in F and B making us become you know hyper, at hyper growth level. And when you know when you're growing at that stage. There's something that you will compromise, such as quality, such as consistency, and uh, you have to able to manage it. So uh, our team really focused on the operations and it helped us to reach a profitable level since uh, our day one operations. So uh, we had negative some of the months during the hard times because of the pandemic. But most of the times uh, right now, I, uh, at, uh, if we analyze it, I think, uh, our company, Daily Box, as a group, uh, pro uh, operating on profitable level, and we're trying to keep maintain that way uh, while looking for you know double digit growth. But yeah, it's kind of challenging because uh, I'm also want to thank uh, uh, partners like Mario who help us to reach that growth level because you know sometimes expanding to new cities, new locations. You, you, you're opening like five to six outlets in a month. Uh, you, you must, like you said, Victor, we want to minimize the failure 
right? Because when 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 you when you do uh, operations at that fast scale, it will uh, at some point the mar margin errors uh, was getting uh, larger, right? So so yes, uh, we our team still trying and learning to. Uh, you know, utilizing the data that we have to improve our operations. Thank you for sharing, Kelvin. That's, uh, I, again, I think that's uh, great. And you are right. It's how, how do you expand multiple locations in a month uh, without compromising on quality or quality control? It's all about, you know, operations and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Jason, uh, you have, a, I think, a very extensive background in finance. And I'd love to hear how that has added to the rapid growth of your company, Just Kitchen. Well, thanks, Victor. Extensive, I, I, I don't know. I, I have some, some background in finance. Um, I think the part that really, you know, made me, a, you know, sort of that's helped me, I think, is it, it's, it, it's, Always, it's always at the at the forefront of, of thought when um, when taking in um, investments, funding from from equity partners, you know, shareholders. Um, it's how you're spending it. It's you know, I, I always want to spend each dollar for for that, that. It's contributing to value. You know, it's either in investing in in human capital or or or, um, you know, um, infrastructure capital or some sort of equity that is going to generate a return down the road that's building value for the company. Um, I think that's very important because as you take money in, uh, you know, people are entrusting you with, with obviously with their investment dollars. Um, so I think having that, having that sort of investment, back, investment banking background um, is I'm, I'm always thinking about value. You know, how is that dollar, how am I going to take that dollar in and then turn it into, um, you know, $2 on the output? You know, it may not be immediate, but it's, it, but it's, it's got to be building towards something. And I think just having the, the concept of, of that, that building, um, you know, sort of investing in building blocks is, um, I think it's really the, the one single largest thing that's, that's helped me in navigating sort of through this, this new, new frontier, if you will. Awesome, Jason. Thank you so much. I mean, that is a great way for a, I guess, a founder to think about or a CEO to think about how money comes in, how you hope and you target that the dollar that comes in at least eventually is not, is more than $1 as it goes out or gets returned back to your investor. And I think that's the right attitude uh, for all of us. Obviously, as a startup, uh, we cannot always guarantee that, of course. But I think that's uh, you know, the essence or the spirit is, I'm sure, something for all of us in this chat right now. And I think that's a great way for you to explain it. So thank you so much. Um, so I want to go into specific questions for specific founders and CEOs now. So first, Mario. Um, Yummy Corp recently announced a very interesting partnership with Grab to help F&B businesses in Indonesia digitize. Um, what impacts have you seen with this partnership? And do you see opportunities for similar international partnerships using Grab's platform? So um, <clears throat> just to give a little bit of context, right? The, the main core idea of the partnership is that, um, you know, as Yummy Corp, is uh, an operator for other FNBs. Uh, what we have seen in Grab's use case is that Grab has their own set of you know cloud kitchens uh, that are primarily uh, providing spaces for brands to operate, right? But what they've uh, what they've seen is that you know they may have a few brands that are doing well in one of their kitchens, but. But when they ask them to join them in a different location, that brand would not have the resource and manpower management capabilities to, to join and grow in other kitchens, right? So that's kind of where Yummy comes in uh, through mm -hmm. this partnership with Grab, right? Grab will introduce them to us and then we will be operating those brands inside Grab's other kitchens. <clears throat> um, so for us, I think that is, um, that is, 
that is a breakthrough in terms of a business model for a grab scenario, just because they would then be able to really make, uh, really help uh, thriving, uh, essentially businesses that are ready to scale and thrive to scale up um, inside their platform. And we're, con uh, we're, we're contributing to that kind of, uh, that in, in a role of essentially helping them as we're essentially, you know, I, I wouldn't, it's not as crude as like essentially an outsource, but we are empowering capabilities that they don't have uh, or they are not yet able to build in-house, right? So um, so we're looking at doing this successfully in Indonesia yet, uh, Indonesia first. So I think we were not really, I would say there's a lot, still a lot of learning and a lot of adjustment and a lot of kind of, you know, uh, details that we're working out together. But as we as we work this out, the plan, uh, and we would hope to really uh, roll this out in other markets where we'll probably, as as um, Kelvin mentioned earlier, we'll probably look into other cities in Indonesia first. So the tier two, tier three cities where Grab uh, is present. But afterwards, we're also looking into seeing if this model would work in other countries. It may not work in every country, but um, but there are but there are markets that we have identified to be sensible to do this. Uh, thank you for sharing, Mario. I think it it's a very sound idea, and you're already in the process of implementing and learning more. And I'm sure um, we'll see some great results. Uh, I look yeah. forward to learning more about it in the news uh, or in uh, our private chats. Um, <laughs> yes, um, Jonathan. Um, so, before rebranding to Pop Meals, Dama Khan, as I understand it, but please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, placed an emphasis on healthy offerings and was sort of operated as an online-only restaurant. Um, what was the realization that led to this pivot towards how Pop Meals is operating now? Yeah, I think for, for us, essentially, um, uh, what the pandemic... Uh, 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 did was uh, to to kind of accelerate a couple of like decisions that we already had, always had in the back of our head. So indeed, um, for us, it was always kind of the the the, the ambition to build a, a brand that um, can serve customers, um, you know, uh, uh, like uh, delicious food at, 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 uh, in the most convenient way and affordable for kind of every day, right? And previously with the Damakam brand, the Damakam brand was I mean healthy but especially also premium position. So it was always kind of for us. Um, when we first started, that this was a bit like the uh, you know the, the initial um, niche market we want to go into in order to then broaden up the uh, the positioning of the brand and uh, and with that the, the target market um, right in a, a bit in a way like uh, you know how many big companies did, did it like say like uh, I mean uh, maybe a bit of an odd analogy but like say a Facebook right when they started in the first just focusing on certain universities like uh, uh, Harvard or so and then expanded from there in, into really a, a much more um, a broader appealing um, brand and, and um, product. And that's kind of like the trajectory we always had in the back of our head. But then, um, of course, uh, we didn't expect to do this this rebranding and this transition into that so quickly. Um, I think, uh, yeah, again, the pandemic, I guess there was a bit of a, a blessing in disguise uh, that, uh, that we then said, okay, uh, so many things are changing. Uh, if we want to make really big decisions quick, then now it's the best time to do that. Um, and then, so uh, last year, yeah, we we uh, then essentially just made that switch <laughs> quite quite brutal in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, never never looked back. Um, and uh, yeah, now we're uh, super excited because it's obviously uh, very much aligned with kind of yeah where we want to be, where we wanted to be in say like two or three years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, we are there now today. Thank you for sharing, Jonathan. I mean, yeah, looking from afar and knowing Damakan, the brand, and how well it's done, it was uh, pretty surprising from an outsider who doesn't work there to all of a sudden see one day, oh, we are now rebranded as Pop Meals. And uh, now I have more in-depth insight from this uh, idea where this is where you're going anyways. And, you know, it's just because of the pandemic, you've decided to speed it up. And uh, I love that aggressiveness, and I love the idea to just sort of jump in and go, go about it. Uh, thanks again, Jonathan, for sharing that insight. Um, Kelvin, so, I mean, Daily Box has done some very interesting things because you've collaborated with renowned chefs in menu and recipe creation, um, and you have this single brand as a platform, right? So 
What benefits has the single brand strategy brought? And how does that compare to multi-brands in your opinion? Uh, Kelvin, the uh, mute button. So to actually to emphasize what I uh, uh, said earlier about we want to create a brand that's sustainable. As you know, building a brand, uh, a strong brand equity is not, it's not cheap. <laughs> you have to put a lot of resources into it to building a strong brand, you know. And sometimes in the food business, as you know, food is all about trend, right? So we don't want that to happen, especially when the trend faded out, you have to, you know, shutting down the brand. And especially when we build brands like Daily Box, it's, uh, it's, it's so versatile, right? We can offer Chinese food, Indonesian, Japanese food, as long as it's the form of a rice, but you, I could call it, you can call it Daily Box. So uh, we're thinking that, uh, so why we need to uh, separate our resources, especially uh, at that time, we are very low in capital, actually, Victor. So <laughs> we're thinking that why, why we have to spray and pray and that just, let's just focus on building a strong brand and uh, collaborating with uh, the known chef, uh, like Master Chef, like uh, Chef Yuna, Chef Renata, with millions of followers. We're also collaborating with a uh, public figure uh, with um, millions of subscribers. And now we also adding menus from MSME, uh, even from a uh, housewife. Uh, now you can, you know, educate them, teach them how to produce consistency products, helping them during the pandemic. Even uh, a, a great story that I heard is uh, some of them, some of our partners able to bring their kids to college because they supply their products to Daily Box now. So we're seeing that we have grown from selling a rice box into be become a platform to uh, empower like uh, MSME, empower other brands even. Uh, right now we have bread brands, we're collaborating with Bread Life, one of the bread chain here in Indonesia, to be our partner. So we don't need to make everything by ourselves right now. What uh, I always like the analogy of IKEA. I said, uh, we are like IKEA of the food where you don't have your designers, you have a lot of great designers design products for you, you don't have the manufacturer, uh, even uh, we expand our, our uh, sales through Cloud Pitch and also with uh, a lot of partners and hopefully we can collaborate when I expand to other countries with uh, Victor, Jason and Jonathan. And so uh, as we boost Daily Box uh, as our main brand for ready to eat products, uh, we also have brands like Daily Meals where it's frozen products because, you know, uh, and also Shirato, a Japanese, because uh, the, the position we position our brand, the way we position our brand is more like Daily Box is more like comfort food brand, uh, rice uh, focused brand. Shirato is like focus on Japanese, where uh, the segment market for Japanese food here in Indonesia is, uh, is already there. So we want to tap into that market. And Daily Mills is more like ready to serve a uh, uh, pre-packed meal. You just need to, to uh, frozen it and defrost it and serve it for family because they, Daily Box and Shirako uh, serve uh, single customers. So, uh, yeah, I think working, uh, become a platform, uh, make you a limitless uh, innovations, right? Uh, we want to introduce in the richness of Indonesian culinary to Taiwan, to Philippines, to Singapore, to across the region. And we also want to bring the richness of culinary from Taiwan, Philippines, Singapore, here into Indonesia. So uh, it, it enabled us to do that. Uh, because right now we have grown not only a brand that serves certain kind of products, but become a platform for everybody to collaboration. Kelvin, thank you so much. I love that explanation. And yes, uh, I do hope, and I'm sure, you know, Jonathan and Jason do hope that we all get to collaborate with one another sooner versus later. Uh, <laughs> Jason, so um, Just Kitchen has done something that sticks out to, I'm sure, a lot of people, not just in food tech. Um, Just Kitchen has become publicly traded in Canada. 
And then following up with that, also in Europe and American markets. This is uh, something that is uh, really amazing. Um, your current operations are still focused on Asia with Taiwan and Hong Kong, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but you have stated publicly and also privately that uh, you're looking for global expansion into the Americas. So do you see that same business model that we do here in Asia working in America? Or do you have a different view of how to go into um, the Americas and an example, for example, not just America, but new markets in general. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think, uh, I think every region is, is, uh, is different. So, so as mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're coming at it from, from two sides, right? So we've got the infrastructure side and then we've got the content side, you know, and the content really was the, the, the genesis of just kitchen. It was about bringing um, home, you know, the sense of, of being close to home, you know, having, having grown up in North America myself, you know, one, it was one, one of those things, whenever I came back to Taiwan to visit, um, after getting settled in and getting over jet lag and whatnot, the first thing that I, I always looked to do was to go and search out the food that I that I'd had had for a year or whatever that uh, being, being, being away from home. Um, so really it was about bringing that closeness, that feeling of home to, to every market. And as we land into different markets, as we're in Hong Kong, you know, we're, we're uh, in the process of absorbing local brands from Hong Kong and bringing it elsewhere. So it becomes a platform where, where it just kind of brings the world closer, uh, our consumers closer to home. So that, you know, in of itself doesn't change regardless of our, you know, whichever market we're going to. In the U.S., you know, we would want to, you know, bring Taiwanese food to Taiwanese Americans. We want to bring Hong Kong food to, to you know, people that's come from Hong Kong, you know, when, you know Philippines. You know, so it's kind of that, that overall platform to, to serve um, people that miss the food and also introduce that food to, to a, a new clientele. Um, so th I think that is universal. Um, where I think it does differ a little bit would be the, the infrastructure side. Um, you know, geography, you know, population density, I think all that comes into play as how you build out that distribution network, as I mentioned. Um, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, you know, where it's much more dense in Indonesia, in, you know, the Philippines, you know, we can do the, 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 the kitchens where, it, you know, logistically all that kind of stuff sort of works. Um, whereas in places like North America and other parts of the world where it's a little further distributed out, you know, it may be, um, a partnership or you may be going into, um, you know, an infrastructure provider where we go and operate ourselves. So in, in, the, con in the context of, of infrastructure, I think, I think it, it requires adoption. Um, but in terms of content, you know, um, you know digitali digitalization of, of SOP, of build charts, of, um, of sort of how that, that cuisine is brought to the market, I think that would be, this, you know, that would be, on a standard that we would we would sort of deploy universally, but yeah, so so two different parts and uh, and sort of two different ways of adopting. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, very clear and concise as far as your thoughts on this topic, and uh, yeah, it's a very very interesting new world where we're all moving forward, uh, making the first steps. So this is I, this is sort of like food delivery ten years ago when uh, we were all trying out a lot of different things. And then if this doesn't work, I'm going to try that and vice versa. So very excited. Um, and I think our time is more or less up, but I do first and foremost want to share our speakers, uh, Mario, Jonathan, Kelvin, Jason. I want to thank you guys um, on behalf of Foodland Ventures and myself, obviously, uh, for taking the time out and chatting and sharing with everyone uh, what's been going on lately with you guys and your company. So that's the first thing. And I want to, again, thank you for all the people who are signing in and listening and viewing this. Um, and this is the uh, APAC F&B Innovation Summit by Foodland Ventures. And uh, I want to say thank you to everybody. We're signing off. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Working with you all. <laughs>